I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 68 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 068. Well, I'm back. For those of you who are wondering exactly what happened, well, mm, that is a little bit of a sore point for me. You see, in the last show notes, I actually attached, oh, probably a day or two after I published them, I attached a memo saying, hey, I'm not going to have any new episodes for four or five weeks. The problem is I thought, oh, I'll be neat and I'll highlight it and with one color in the background and change the text so it's even more outstanding. I kind of messed that up. I made it all white, so nobody saw it. Well, except for Jennifer, who highlights everything to scroll. Well, at least that's what she says she does. I don't know how that works. However, Jennifer emailed me saying, Hey, uh, nobody's seeing this unless they're doing, unless they're highlighting your page. So I went back, I fixed it, and here we are. I apologize. And I apologize for what I thought was giving notice, but nobody else seemed to receive. Now, I'll come back to why I haven't been on the podcast lately, why I took a four or five weeks off. I really don't remember how many weeks I've taken off, to be honest, but I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, let's get on to our carry tip, which is keep your holster in a good condition, or keep your holster in good condition. I've been out of this so long, I've got rust flaking off of me as I speak. The reason you want to keep your holster in good condition is, number one, your holster protects your weapon as much as it holds it. If your holster is not in good condition, it can actually cause wear and tear on the weapon that would not normally be there. Another reason you want to keep your holster in good condition is a phenomena that people refer to as Glock leg. Why they use the term Glock leg when it could easily be called M&P leg? Well, in some M&Ps. Or it could be called XD leg? I don't know. Maybe it's because Glock is the most common uh, double action only heavy trigger pull on pistol out there. But if you got a worn holster, you can be holstering the weapon. Part of the holster gets into the trigger guard as you're putting the weapon into the holster, and bang, you have a discharge. Maybe a bullet hits uh, meat. Maybe it's just a muzzle blast burns some meat. But either way, it's a very uncomfortable thing to experience. Not that I've experienced that one, but mm, it doesn't look comfortable, and I'm going to assume that it's not comfortable. You can tell me what assuming makes out of me and you if you want, but that's I've got some experience with... uh, with injuries from firearms, so I'm going to say, yeah, that probably hurt. And that assumption is probably not going to be far off base. Yeah, keep your holster in a good condition. It'll help retain your weapon better. It will help protect your weapon better, and it'll help protect you better. Now, before I go and tell you what all's been going on, let me hit the Get Show audio clip so people know how to get the show, and then we'll be right back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on MyRoPlayer, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, the reason I've been out is I've got a number of things going on that are not podcast related. And the real estate thing that I mentioned in the previous episode, mm, I've turned all that over to a realtor. I'm not dealing with that uh, until we're a little closer to being done. However, a lot of stuff going on. I'm actually working on getting another podcast launched. And that brings me to the one piece of listener feedback that I was asked to deal with on air. This gentleman, he wants to be identified as Jake is getting ready to launch a podcast. It's not firearm related. Well, let me just read you what he said, typed. I'm getting ready to release my own podcast. However, it is not directly firearm related, although a lot of people in the firearms community should be interested in it. Now I asked him to give me some more information about his podcast and hopefully he will. But anyways, he asked me about equipment I use and how I do everything. And I'm going to throw this out there to him. First off, I really don't do editing. I really don't do editing. It's one take, and that's it. It's done. Secondly, equipment-wise, well, I guess it all starts at the power distribution box. Now, that's a Furman M8 
X2, I believe. It's a Furman. It's got a port on the front. It's got like eight on the back. And it's a noise conditioner. I highly recommend getting the noise conditioner. Everything plugs into it if it goes into the mixer. The computer I'm using right now is not plugged into it because, well, that computer is not needing, does not need a noise conditioner. It's not hooked up to the mixer. Anyways, from there, I guess we can say everything else. I'll just address what's on the rack because I got a small rack that I've got everything mounted on. I have a headphone amp. When I when I was looking at headphone amps, I looked at four, eight, and six channel headphone amps. Behringer had a four channel and an eight channel. There wasn't much of a price difference. And then one day the eight channel was on sale for less than the four channel. So I went with the eight channel. And I believe the eight channel's an MDX 4800 or 4600. Give me just a second. Okay. It's an HA, it's an HA 8000. That's what it is. It's got eight ports for headphones on the front, and it's got eight ports for headphones on the back. And the best thing is there's eight separate channels. You can support 16 headphones, but you only got eight control knobs. I will never use that many headphones. I have at one time had five headphones plugged into this. Now moving on further down the rack, I have a Behringer Multicom Pro XL. Uh, it's, it's what makes my voice sound like it does rather than sandpaper. Okay, it's not quite that bad. Now that is the MDX 4600. It's a four channel a compressor, limiter, expander, gate thing. It does all kinds of stuff. I really don't use all of it. I have a four channel snake that goes from it to my mixer and that snake plugs into the inserts. <laughs> and that's a little bit of a complicated setup, but the insert has one plug. It looks like a stereo headphone plug on the end that goes into the mixer. It's really a tip ring sleeve design. And on the end that goes, or the ends that go into the uh, mix, into the Multicom, there's two and they're tip sleeve, which look like mono plugs. The thing about it is one's a send and one's a return. And that's basically how the sound goes from the mixer to the compressor limiter and then back to the mixer. The mixer is a Mackie Pro FX16 and it feeds a number of different microphones, although it's a Samsung Q2A that I use. This microphone's virtually identical to the ATR2100 and 2005 microphones. I have a number of different devices plugged into the mixer. However, the ones that really need to be discussed, besides the headphone amp, the compressor limiter, and the microphone, are my soundboard that I use, which is an, it's an Asus Google Nexus 7 tablet, I believe. It's an older tablet. Uh, the newer ones have newer features of the same. The newer ones of the same model have added features. This is an older one running Cyanogen Mod. It's connected with a stereo cable. I think it's the only thing I got connected to it with a stereo cable. I think everything else is connected with mono cables. I have a couple of mix minus channels hooked up. And then I have, well, I have a four channel snake. It has tippering sleeve connectors that run to a Zoom H6. And the Zoom H6 records everything onto an SD card. I have thought about trying to work out some way to do six-channel mixing, but mm, I'd have to change mixers, so that's not happening. But that's basically the hardware I use. Software, after it comes out of the H6N, or H6, after it comes out of the H6, I just simply take it, uh, dump it into a desktop computer, run it through Audacity. I got a chain that I've set up to process it. It spits out a WAV file. The WAV file goes into a conversion program. And the reason I, use, I don't convert it to a MP3 in Audacity, I have, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. I don't like how that MP3 sounds. I get the sound I want from this other program, and there's not that much difference in that sound, but it's something that irritates me. So I don't use the built-in audio from Audacity or the built-in conversion. It's not really built-in. It's I think it's Lame or Lib MP3 or uh, it's an MP3 uh, library that Audacity uses, and it's not 100% the way I like it. But then I feed it to another program. It's a script I wrote that actually uses a couple other programs to add all my MP3 tag data, and when that's done. It spits out the final version of the file 
And then I can go in and create the video version, create the stereo version, and everybody's happy. And there you go. That's the equipment I use. That's how I do it. I'm tired of discussing things that are not gun related though. So let me run the social media uh, thing and then you can, and we'll come back and we'll actually hit our topic and the social media thing, like the get, how to get the show, how to contact me, the sign on, the sign off, all that nonsense is on the Nexus tablet. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, this episode, I want to talk about positive promotion for gun rights. This applies anywhere in the nation, but, you know, basically, we need to concentrate on this in Texas. There's a number of areas that you really need to touch on when you're considering positive promotion. You need to consider media relations, public relations, and those, well, a lot of people may think they're the same. They're not. You want to also consider law enforcement relations and political relations. And then there's a fifth one I'm not really going to touch on it. That's intergroup relations. <sighs> well, let's start it off with media relations. The thing about the media is they run articles, whether it's a TV show or a TV broadcast, if it's a radio broadcast, or if it's a newspaper, magazine, they always have an article. Now, these articles are now going out on the Internet. They're being published to Facebook. They're being published to their websites. They're being tweeted out there, or links to the articles are being tweeted out there. And there's really three types of articles you need to concern yourself with. Incorrect articles, correct articles, and obviously biased articles. Let's talk about incorrect articles first, though. There's an article you're reading in the paper, maybe you're watching TV, and there's incorrect information in there. Maybe they're saying the open carry law goes into effect September 1st. But you, being the very astute gun rights advocate you are, you know the Texas open carry law doesn't go into effect until January 1st. What do you do? Well, maybe you go out there and you call them up and you tell them, you're wrong. Your article is completely wrong. Are you trying to get people arrested? No, that's not how you do it. The way you address it is maybe you call them. Maybe you email them. Maybe you just reply to them on Facebook and you tell them, I think you may have some wrong information in your article. According to the text of House Bill 910, the open carry law, it goes into effect January 1st. Here's the link to the bill. And it's on page whatever the page is, and that's usually at the very end of the bill. And then let them see if they want to correct it or not. If they don't, then you go back and you deal with it. The second type of article you want to deal with is the correct article. And when an article's correct, a lot of people, yes, they did it right, and then move on. No, that's not how we do things. That's not how we need to do things. And that's not how we want to do things. When you see an article that's correct, give them praise. Let them know, hey, that's a good article. Great information. I'm glad you're sharing it. Uh, if you need anything, let me know. I'll be more than glad to help you. And then move on. And then you come to the obviously biased articles. Now, these articles are the ones where somebody is obviously biased. And you, a lot of times, incorrect information is taken to be as an obvious bias, but it's not. An obviously biased article might be, Police say the uh, police say the suspect was arrested and a cache of weapons was found in his house. Recovered were two pistols and a shotgun. That's not much of a cache of weapons. Or maybe instead of a cache, it's an arsenal. That's not much of an arsenal either. That's an incorrect article. It may be incorrect because they got information from the police, or it may be incorrect because the uh, the author of the article or the reporter just basically thought, oh, this makes it sound better. And you need to let them know about the incorrect information in the articles. Don't be aggressive about it. Be friendly. Be nice. Be polite. Now, an obviously biased article would be something more to the tune of, the suspect was arrested, but will get off because of the gun show loophole that prevents him from being arrested for selling weapons to illegal immigrants who are going to smuggle them back to Mexico. That would be more of an obvious bias. It becomes even more obvious when it's 
this reporter feels it's now left the it's now left being a report and has moved into being an editorial. And that's where you need to contact them and you know, don't contact them telling them why they're wrong. Contact them, write a letter to the editor, offer to do an interview if it's a TV or radio program, and let them know, hey, the man was arrested not because he was selling guns to illegal immigrants who were going to smuggle them to drug dealers in Mexico. Here's another source that says the suspect was arrested because he was a four-time felon in possession of a firearm. Nothing to do with the gun show loophole, nothing to do with running guns to Mexico. And then you want to help your local media. I've kind of touched on this in the run-up to it, but when you're dealing with the articles, you really want to help them. You want to provide them with a pro-gun contact. This can be you or it can be somebody else. If it's somebody else, make sure it's the best contact you can give them. If it's you and there's somebody that's a better contact, tell them, hey, so-and-so's real good. If you can't get him, holler at me. I'll do what I can. Always let them know that while you may be you may know what you're talking about, so-and-so knows even more. Point them to the best resource you can, even if it's not you. Also, provide them with a link to gunfacts.info. A lot of information that, uh, that they may not know, that they're ignorant of, they can check it on gunfacts.info. And when they check it, maybe they'll find out they're wrong. Maybe they'll find out that the press release they got from the Brady campaign that's quoting 7,000 Americans are killed every hour by guns in their homes that are unloaded, that were bought through the gun show loophole. Yeah, I know. Maybe when they get that press release and they check it against gunfacts.info, it's, wait a minute, this isn't quite on the level. Maybe I don't want to run the story. Or maybe I want to look deeper into it and see why they're not providing correct information. And then offer to help them when they need it. Let the let them know, hey, I understand you're busy. I understand you're pressed for time. You're trying to get articles out in a timely manner. If you need to know something about firearms, let me know. I may not know the answer, but I know people who do. And I can, put, I can point you to the right people at the right time, and I'm more than happy to help you. Make sure they know that they can have, that you're willing to help them. And then when you interact with them in person, be sure to dress professionally. If you're going to be on TV or you're going to have your picture taken, talk professionally. And when I say talk professionally, I don't, I don't mean use big, long words, although that would probably help and make you look more like an authority figure to them. I'm talking about don't use cuss words. Don't use slang. Use the proper terminology for the weapon. Explain the terminology. And that might be something as simple as saying, well, the biggest factor in this whole situation is the officer dropped the magazine from the weapon, and because the weapon has a magazine disconnect, it was unable to function. This probably saved the officer's life because the suspect could not get the weapon to fire. Well, that means one thing. However, if you tell them, if you explain it to them, when the officer realized he was probably going to lose control of his weapon, he pressed the magazine release, which is what most people call a clip, or most people call, or you might say, which is what most people incorrectly call a clip, releasing the magazine, or ah, let me redo that. When the officer realized he was about to lose his weapon, he pressed the magazine release, which allowed the magazine, which is what most people call a clip, to be released from the weapon. Because his firearm had a magazine disconnect, which prevents the weapon from firing without the magazine, the criminal was unable to make the weapon work without the magazine. This saved the officer's life if, uh, or you might say, I am more than certain this saved the officer's life. And then you go on, you talk about how this is a sign of good training on the officer's part, and yada yada. And then you also want to talk like a lawyer and choose your words carefully. Don't use words that have any kind of ambiguity to them. Don't say, don't phrase everything in absolutes. Don't say, law-abiding gun owners never shoot anybody. Because they'll turn that around and throw it in your face. Well, what about uh, so-and-so who shot the suspect that was raping his 10-year-old daughter? He was law-abiding and he shot somebody. And now you look like a liar. So you point out that most law-abiding gun owners never shoot anybody and when they do it is almost always a legally justified shooting now you are thoroughly protected from being called a liar because if they go back and they parse your words they have to go in they have to edit it to make you look bad and while they may not be above that 
at least you are prepared and you have audio recordings of your own interview so that you can say, hey, that was edited. Here's the real quote. But when you when it comes right down to it, most media, most people in the media are coming at it from one of two different angles. They either want to get the story and get it out there or they want to make the money. Most of them don't have an agenda. The ones that have the agenda are way up the food chain. And I'm talking about local. I'm not talking about national level. And when when they are given a resource that will make their time to time from starting the article to releasing the article shorter and they can provide a more accurate and complete article that will draw in more sponsors and advertisers, they are more than willing to use that. And if you make yourself available as that resource, you are helping gun rights. But then you have public relations. Public relations and media relations are two different things. And we're going to look at it from two different points of view. We're going to look at public relations as an individual and as a group. As an individual, don't be Burt Gummer. Now, if you haven't seen the Tremors TV show or the series of movies, well, you don't really get that reference. The thing about Burt Gummer is he's a hardcore survivalist, uh, conspiracy nut, yada, yada. Kind of like Corey Watkins on steroids. Well, not really steroids. Corey Watkins on more or less an exaggeration of Corey Watkins. The thing is, you want to do your best to leave a positive impression on everyone you meet, even if they're on the opposition. And I'll come back to that term opposition in a moment. If someone's opposed to your point of view, you want to make sure that when you leave that contact with them, you've done everything you can to make them think, you know, if it wasn't for the fact I disagree with him on the gun issue, I could consider him my best friend. That's really where you want to be. Because if you leave a positive impression on them, they're going to be more open to dealing with you in the future. And if they're exposed to your position enough, maybe, just maybe, you convert them from their point of view to your point of view. Or even less desirable, but still preferable to them staying with their point of view, maybe you convert them to something in between. And then as a new as an individual, invite new shooters to the range. And when you do this, do this safely and stress safety. As an individual, you want to do anything to bring new shooters in because as a, as a movement, the more we grow, the more power we have. You want to leave a positive impression on everyone you meet, and you don't want to be Burt Gummer because he doesn't leave a positive impression on everyone he meets. A lot of people think Burt Gummer's crazy. Now, as a group, there's really two categories of things a group needs to keep in mind. And a group, I'm not talking about something like the TSRA or OCT or OCTC or any of these other groups. I'm talking about maybe you're a local gun club or maybe your group is three or four friends that go out shooting together and you're just looking for something to do to promote gun rights at, among your little group. What not to do? Obviously, armed groups are intimidating to the general public. So don't go out there and don't make a scene while being armed. Don't be visibly armed if you're going to go out there and you're going to do, you're going to do heavy-duty promotion. If you're going to be... And when I say visibly armed, I'm talking like AR-15s and things like that. If there's three or four of you, you're eating at your favorite cafe, all year open carrying after January 1st, guess what? No problem. I'm cool with that. But if you're, if you're carrying your weapons at ready and you've got an AR-15 and you're stomping around, chanting, down with gun control, power to the people, yada, yada, you're going to intimidate people. Don't do that. Don't be Corey Watkins. Don't be C.J. Grisham. Don't go out there and cause a scene. Causing a scene turns the public against you. Avoid the inflammatory rhetoric because it hurts the cause no matter how fitting it is. And this is something OCT and the other open carry groups really need to work on. The whole butter thing that they've got going on. This is an attack on other gun owners. And it's the whole, well, I'm a gun owner, but guess what? Don't attack them for uh, for not agreeing with you 100%. Work on getting them to move from where they're at to where you're at. Don't harass them. Don't attack them. Invite them over. This is kind of like the churches that want to ban uh, gays and bisexuals and lesbians and anybody that doesn't agree with them on the subject of sex. 
I hate to tell it to you, but if your church is like that, you're doing it wrong. You want to reach out to these people. You want to invite them in and show them the error of their ways. You don't want to drive them to the other camp. And the same thing applies to the gun rights movement. You don't want to drive gun owners to the gun control crowd. But if you keep attacking people, they're going to attack you back. And when they attack you back, they are now attacking you with the gun banners. And then you run the danger of them deciding the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And we don't want that. Another thing you don't want to do as a group is show support for criminal acts. Because this makes you look like a criminal, even if you feel the act that they committed was justified and righteous. A good example of this. There was a shooting in a bar. The guy ran from the scene. I mean, it was a good defensive shoot. He ran from the scene. OCT supposedly knew who he was. They refused to, they were wanted to help him with his legal bills, but they refused to, they refused to say who he was to the public. Guess what? When you do something like that, it makes you look like you're a criminal too. This guy, when he ran from the scene, he already had a good defense to what he had done. What he had done was he'd carried a weapon into a 51% location. I don't know if he was licensed or not. If he was licensed, he didn't have to worry because he had the necessity defense. If he wasn't licensed, he didn't have to worry because he had a necessity defense. Maybe he was a criminal already and he was worried about going to jail again for being a felon in possession of a handgun. But wait a minute. He had a necessity defense. I'm no attorney, but I have been told that this is, this necessity defense is a good way to defend yourself if you're finding yourself being charged with a crime simply because you don't have a, any other option. Basically, what I'm saying is, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. In the necessity defense, and this is off topic, if you are doing something that's not legal, but it's necessary to protect yourself to do this, then it's a defense to prosecution. And another thing, and it's going to be the last thing I touch on for what not to do as a group, publicity stunts. Don't do publicity stunts. They lead to you getting arrested. They lead to you having to go to court. Maybe it's a civil matter. Maybe it's a criminal matter. But publicity stunts don't help. They hurt. But you know what? Let's talk about what to do as a group. Community service. Community service is a great thing. It, go, it shows that your group is out there. You're normal people. You're trying to help the community. And where you're not normal is you're positive, outstanding, outgoing citizens that are out there trying to make a positive difference. It helps present your group as a positive influence on the community, which is something else you want to do. You always want to present your group as a positive influence. You also want to provide a unified front as a group. You can't have, let's say you got Bradley over here saying, we want all, we want open carry. We'll take anything we can get. And then you have Steve over here saying, we want open carry, but we're only going to accept constitutional carry. Your group's divided. And the press is going to run with that. The public's going to run with that. And they're going to say, well, even such and such group does not agree. No. You sit down and you make sure everybody knows we're going to accept whatever we get. Or we're not going to accept anything but this. And you do it in a unified manner. You make sure that when somebody's talking as a member of the group, they promote the group's position. If they're not talking as a member of the group, they don't have to do anything about the group. And this means your entire group has to operate on the same page. Everybody has to know what everybody else is doing in this regard. Everybody has to know what everybody else will do in this regard. This is critical. And then you want to publicize your positive efforts. And you want to invite the media to help publicize it. Next up, we have law enforcement relations. Law enforcement relations are very critical if you want to have any kind of positive influence as a gun rights organization or if you're trying to just simply promote gun rights in general as an individual. You may be thinking, well, what are the law enforcement relations we're talking about? First off, you want to attend law enforcement outreach efforts. If your sheriff's department's doing a citizens on patrol class, go take it. It'll let you meet some of the officers. It'll let you get a contact with them. And now you're a normal person to them. You're somebody they know a little bit more about and you're no longer let you're no longer a less than known quantity. And on the same vein, you want to interact with law enforcement officers anytime you have a positive contact chance or a chance for positive contact. 
If a positive contact is possible, you want to take advantage of that opportunity. As a group, you may want to hold fundraising events to help equip a small budget department, or maybe you want to help the family of an officer that's injured or killed in the line of duty, or maybe even that's not in the line of duty. Maybe if you're in a larger group, you want to provide funds for scholarships, and these scholarships could be for law enforcement personnel and for their families. Somebody that's in a smaller department, right now a lot of officers are getting their continuing education uh, requirements out of the way. These can be expensive. Guess what? If your group says, hey, uh, such and such PD, I understand you all have to, your officers have to supply their own equipment. They have to pay for their own continuing education credits. We're going to, we're going to offer XYZ amount of money to your department for continuing education on this. Or maybe we're going to invest in X number of vest bulletproof vest for your officers, or we're going to offer X number of dollars to equip your department with bulletproof vest, or maybe we're going to provide your officers with these less lethal options. We have a bunch of Remington shotgun pump shotguns, and we're going, we're going to paint them orange. We're going to hand them over to your department as a donation where you can load them up with bean bag rounds for less lethal options, one for each car. But what you do is you're going out there, you're helping them, you're providing scholarships for their continuing education, or maybe you're providing scholarships for officers to, uh, maybe you're providing scholarships to the department for potential officers. Maybe you tell them, okay, we will provide this scholarship to your department to give to a potential officer that you put under contract to sign up with your department. Or maybe you have an officer that's uh done something good and he's got a son that's about to go to college and we're going to give the, your officer's son a scholarship based on the law enforcement history of his father. But as a group, you want to hold these fundraising events to help these departments because then when it comes time for legislation and your group's saying, hey, this is what we need. Can you support us? And these departments say, hey, these guys, they're pretty good guys. They've done nothing but help us. Heck. You know, uh, you know, Jones over here didn't have a weapon when he signed up. He couldn't afford one for a little while, and they loaned him a weapon, a belt, and a holster. They did everything in their power to make sure he was properly equipped. Yeah, we'll step in and we'll help them. And as a result, they're going to show solidarity with you, but you need to show solidarity with them as well. Somebody shows up, they're agitating the local law enforcement. Maybe you show up and you're just there, you're standing with them, you're giving a statement, we support these officers, we support this department, or we support the investigation that these officers are conducting into this matter, whatever it is, you show solidarity with them. Maybe you're writing letters to the editor. Maybe you're offering uh, interviews with the local press saying, hey, we have worked with this department. We know these officers, and we know that uh, this is the case here, here, and here, and we know that this isn't the case that these people here are reporting. But what you do is you gain you gain support from these officers and they will support you. And that's what it's all about. You're you're trying to get them on board and on the same page as you. And that's what you're trying to do. And finally, don't be Corey Watkins. Don't be open carry Tarrant County. Don't be going out there and stirring the pot and being anti police. This is not good law enforcement relations. And finally, political relations. This is something that gets overlooked a lot. Do you know when you need to start prepping for the next legislative session? When the current one starts. Anytime you see a news article that promotes your position, collect it. If it's a print it out, save a link to it. If it's in the newspaper, clip it out. Collect those news articles, save them. When the next session starts, when we know who's won and the next session's getting ready, bills are being pre-filed, Contact your local legislators, contact the people you are pretty sure is going to be on this committee or that committee, and give them what they need. Give them these articles. You know, extend that to YouTube content. Collect YouTube content. Give them the links to that. And when somebody starts running that you feel is important, you like their position, you like where they're at, help them out. Help your candidates. Volunteer to uh, volunteer for their campaign. Donate money. Communicate with them. And most importantly, 
Make friends, not enemies. When you go into the political arena, you don't have any enemies. You may have opposition, but you don't have enemies. Never paint politicians or anyone with broad strokes and be a one-issue voter. So you're, you're a gun rights advocate. This is the issue that you really feel the most important about. You're sitting here, you're talking about gun rights, safety, law enforcement, and they're saying, well, we need this uh, school bill passed. This is what my issue is. So I am not going to take a position on this bill. School funding's outside our purview. Well, what if, uh, what if we have an expansion of campus carry? This is going to fund colleges, and if they have the few, if they, and we will uh, strip any funding if they have restrictions of this type. Okay, yeah, I'll sign on to that. That bill has become part of your issue, and you will support it. But you're not going to get involved in anything that's not your issue. You don't want to cloud the pitcher. You don't want to muddy up the waters. And that's really where you want to be. But you know what? I've talked enough about relations and being on, and promoting gun rights. Just remember, everything you do, you want to do it in a positive manner. Don't be open carry Texas. Don't be Corey Watkins. Don't be open carry Tarrant County. I'm going to run the contact audio clip, and then I'm going to come back and hit the news. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Now, while I've been out, there's been quite a bit of news in the uh, gun rights world, and I've narrowed it down to four articles. And these articles are all things that have been released in the last week or so. And I do have something else I want to talk about, but I want to talk about it after the show. So after the sign-off music, there's going to be a tag. And it's going to be something that's something that I feel needs to be covered, even though I really don't have a place for it in my show notes. Our first news item is a litigation alert. And back in episode 25, when this podcast was known as the Open Carry Report, I interviewed Edwin Walker of the Texas Law Shield program. I contacted them and asked to interview someone with their program and asked them to congratulate Mr. Walker for his successful defense of Michael Kewen, who was not a member of the TLS program, but he was arrested in Andrews, Texas, for the record, and in the interest of full disclosure, I received no compensation of any kind from TLS, nor was it ever discussed. They struck me as being interesting and worthy of being looked at closer, apparently, that was the case from a legal point of view, too. You see, recently, TLS has made the news in regards to a class action lawsuit over their practice of playing or of paying to pitch their services as part of many CHL classes. It is in the interest of full disclosure that I mention this case. And I also want to mention in the interest of full disclosure that I am not, nor have I ever been, a client of Texas Law Shield. Now, I would like to mention my only knowledgeable contact with TS, TLS has been in regards to the interview with Edwin Walker. Now, for more show, for more details about the lawsuit, I'm going to throw in a link for this as for this as an article, and just go to the show notes. It'll be gunrightsintexas.com/slash zero six eight. Open up the show notes and follow that link. Now, then, with that said, apparently. People are suing because they have to sit through this class in order to get their CHL. Or they, they have to sit through this sales pitch as part of the class to get their CHL. And they feel pressured to buy into the program. Or at least that's what I come away from the article with. As I said, follow the, follow the link in the show notes and read the article for yourself. I just felt that because I had interviewed them, I needed to mention the lawsuit and disclose that, you know, hey, it was just an interview. There's nothing else there. And people can deal with it as they see fit. On the political side of things, the University of Texas has formed a working group to deal with the legalization of campus carry. The working group will help the UT president write the policies that will deal with campus carry and the restrictions that will be made by the college. Now you can see the full article by going to the show notes and clicking the link. In the same vein, Texas Tech is also working on restrictions and policies that will that they will implement in regards to campus carry. 
The article is from My Fox Lubbock, and it states that each campus will have signage designating acceptable areas where a license holder can carry a gun. Right there, I think it's uh, right there. I think it's kind of a violation of where the bill's actually supposed to put things. You see, if you're going to have signage where you have acceptable areas to carry, you suddenly have a blanket ban, with a few exceptions, and you can't have a blanket ban under the campus carry law. And our final news story in the miscellaneous category, a Midland, Texas business has become a gun store. Now, the business in question is a barber shop, and while not a completely new concept, it is new to the Midland, Odessa area. Now, I'm going to say just as long as the uh, marketing slogan isn't shave in a haircut or shave in a high point two bits, I think it'll work out just fine. If they're charging you uh, two bits or a quarter for, for a high point and a shave, I demand a refund. I know you'll have to pay more if they if you just get the shave, but you couldn't pay me enough money to take a high point. Yeah, I've been away from the microphone too long. My joke isn't funny. And on that note, I want to hit the sign off, and then I want to come back. I want to talk about something that's very important, but some people may not want to hear it, so it's going to be after the show. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Well, Charles Cotton has launched a new program. Uh, it's, he's calling it the CHL's United program. And I think basically, I think everybody here needs to look into it. He chose to use the CHL, uh, name in the CHL's United because of the long history of the program. And a lot of people will keep calling the CHL even after it becomes an LTC. The thing about it is this is a program he's doing to gain political influence and basically political power for the concealed handgun movement, or later the license to carry movement. The beauty of it is, this is an effort that he's doing. It's going to cost ten dollars a year. He's got the chlsunited.com domain pointed to a page at the Texas Firearms Coalition website, and you, all you got to do is type in chls unlimited or chlsunited.com, and then you can go join it. I haven't signed up for it yet. I think I want to see about getting Charles on and discuss this as well as how to report some, how to report improper signage. I'll, I'll probably send him a PM about it and see if he's interested in doing this, uh, doing this this week or next week sometime. See what we can work out with him. I'll ask him to come on, see if, see if he's willing, because this is very interesting to me. I'm going to sign up for it. I'm not going to sign up just yet. I want to talk to him about it. And I'm thinking, Maybe I want to sign up for it while I record the episode so people can see how easy it is. Yeah, I think that'd be kind of cool to do. So I'm going to see if he's interested in coming on. It may be a week or two before we get around to it, but we'll go from there. In fact, I'm going to publish this episode, and then I'll probably send him a PM on the Texas CHL forum about it. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly.